Okay, welcome back to Coulomb's Law and charging. And the first part, we went through the different steps for charging things up, and now we're gonna actually apply it to what's called Coulomb's Law. And Coulomb's Law is the force law that occurs between charges when you bring them closer and closer together or further and further apart. There's a force that exists between those charges that depend on various uh, variables. And you could be thinking about that right now. What kind of things would affect the force uh, between different charges? Now, one of the most spectacular types of charging occurs in nature, and we call the, the effects of that kind of charging, the consequences, lightning. So this is a picture right here showing a huge lightning strike over the town of Scottsdale. And when lightning strikes, it lights up the air, the air becomes a conductor, and it strips electrons right off the air molecules. And when those, when those ions reattach to electrons again, then they give off that, co that blue color light, very characteristic of electrons joining their atoms again and giving off visible light. Well, Ben Franklin, back in the 1700s, he had a hypothesis that the, the lightning striking from the clouds is very similar to the, light, the lightning he would experience when he would grab a doorknob during the wintertime with low, low humidity after walking across the carpeting carpet with his wool socks on. He would draw a wicked spark from the doorknob and it would glow blue just like lightning in the sky. And he conducted his famous kite experiment to test to see if indeed the sky was being uh, electrified just like his body was being electrified as he walked across the carpet and then touched the doorknob and caused electricity to flow, conduct to the doorknob. So this is a, a drawing of Ben Franklin, a, a painting of Ben Franklin that was done by Benjamin West in honor of Benjamin uh, which he earned from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Benjamin Franklin never finished high school, but they gave him a doctorate because he had done a lot of good work past high school that he just didn't get course credit for. So he's the father of electricity. And uh, having that position, somebody better give him a PhD. And he finally got one. He went over to Europe and he gave his little talk on his kite experiment and they honored him by, by giving him the doctorate. Now, when he did the experiment, you often see him outside exposed to the elements as he's flying his kite overhead. But he really was more cautious than that because he knew from looking at downed tree limbs and things like that, that if he were to get struck by lightning, uh, he'd be a goner. So he took a lot of precautions. He flew his kite inside his barn. So he had a big barn on his property and uh, opened the barn doors and then flew the kite uh, being protected from the elements uh, by staying undercover like that. And you can see he's got his assistant here, and over there on its table is this thing called a Leiden jar, which would actually collect charge from the kite by polarization. So we're gonna go through those few little steps there uh, before we talk about Coulomb's Law. But if you um, look at the picture here, you can see he's got his knuckle up there, and there's a key attached to the string uh, of the kite, and in fact, there would be so much polarization of the kite string that he could throw a spark right on his knuckle like that. By the way, your knuckles don't have too many nerve endings, so if you're gonna take a nice spark, uh, that's where you want to take it, right there on your fist, uh, like that. Now, that's a little bit dangerous because electricity wants to flow through the easiest path. And so his body could easily have been electrocuted. And other people have repeated his experiment and have been electrocuted. So I'm going to go back and uh, demonstrate how this Leiden jar helped him do that. So here's the kite. It's up in the sky. And the clouds, when they rub on each other, they actually create charge separation by just 
like we demonstrated in the first video. And the rubbing, when it takes place, the electrons are stripped off water molecules, and water molecules are mostly mass-wise made of protons and neutrons. So they're very massive compared to the electron. So if you rub an electron off of a water molecule, or if you rub it off air molecules, because again, you got water and air, clouds rubbing against each other, the electrons that come off easily move away. So it turns out that our atmosphere is highly charged from being exposed to outer space. And so the electrons will move away towards what's called the ionosphere of the Earth. And then the clouds are basically positively charged on the bottom. And as the charge builds up, on the cloud up there, it becomes more heavily positively charged as more rubbing takes place. And that will, uh, that will polarize the ground, and the ground will become negatively charged. So eventually, uh, what will happen is uh, you'll get so much positive charge here and all this negative charge here that the force that it's pulling this negative charge up into the sky is sufficient to actually cause the air molecules to ionize and carry that charge right up into the sky. So most lightning flows from ground up to the clouds to neutralize the electricity up there. So what old Ben did was he hooked the kite so the kite would get polarized. So remember, the clouds are positively charged, so the kite would become negatively charged up here, and the negative charge is coming from this pathway all the way down to the Leiden jar. And the Leiden jar is a metal cup inside a glass jar, and then another metal cup on the outside. So these two cups, these two metal cups right here are separated by an insulator uh, that is glass. And so this, all this metal right here is hooked up to the kite and that's where the key comes in. So he attached this Leiden jar to the key which then became part of the kite string. And so electrons would flow up this pathway to the kite to try to get as close to the clouds as possible. And that would make the inside of the Leiden jar positively charged. Now, there's an insulator here so that the outside of the Leiden jar would get polarized. So this negative charge you see right here is on the inside of that can, and actually the outside of the jar would be positive. It would just be polarized. And so you could test it and see that it was charged. And there's how he discovered that not only are charges created by rubbing like his wool socks on the carpet, but that the clouds themselves are rubbing and creating charge separation. So all of nature, he discovered, is electric. Okay. Now, in... 1785, now Ben Franklin did his experiment in 1752. So about 32, 30 years later, 33 years later, this guy right over here, his name is Charles Coulomb, he came up with an experiment to measure the force between two charges. So this picture right here shows two opposite charges that have a force of attraction, or you could have two charges, Q1 and Q2, with the same charge, and then they have a force of repulsion. That was his hypothesis. And if we brought those charges closer together, he had demonstrated crudely which I can do right here. I can take this balloon right here and I can charge it up with fur. And again, you can see the force right here between the fur and the balloon. You can see the nice, the closer I get, the stronger the force is. 
And if I approach this thing here and let it touch, so I can put some charge on here, and now they both have exactly the same charge. And I'll let it settle down, and you can see as I get close, you can see the repulsion that's taking place. Now I'm pretty far away right here, so you can see that it's just oscillating back and forth, and it looks like there's no force. But the force is so little, but as I get closer and closer and closer, you can see that the repulsive force of these two like charges is demonstrated. Now, he wanted to get good data. This here is just qualitative. Now, when you do your experiment, you're actually going to use the same setup. We're going to use a much more massive charged object. And we're going to use an equally shaped charged object. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to create this kind of situation right here. But it's going to be much more controlled. And you're going to make the measurements using a video analysis technique that we used back in the first semester. Okay, so here's what he did. He put a charge on these, this little sphere inside the container, and then he introduced another charge here. And what that would do, it would make this little suspended barbell right here twist. Now he's got a piano wire up here. There's a long wire coming down like that. And when he put a force on this little charge right here, it would make it rotate and put twist in a wire. And so by measuring the amount of twist, he could determine how much force was being acted upon this little ball right here. Now they did the same experiment using gravity, where they actually looked at the gravitational force between a ball like this and another ball. He took that experiment and he modified it to look at the force between charges. This is called a torsion pendulum. And this is the experiment you would have done in the lab if you were present on campus. So we had to find a workaround, and the workaround that we're going to use is we're going to have a charge on a ball at the end of a string like a pendulum, and we're going to put a force on it like that. Okay. So anyway, if you ever get to Paris, uh, Coulomb's name is written right on the Eiffel Tower, along with a whole bunch of other famous French historical figures. So it's right along the top there, you can see Coulomb's name. And this is his experimental equation that he came up with. And this is the equation you're going to be studying in the experiment. And it says that the force between two charges, Q1 and to the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And you're going to see how close you can agree with that relationship. And then this constant out here is called the Coulomb constant, and that is the, uh, the, one of the numbers that will be in your, in your theoretical slope. Okay, and at this point, I'm going to stop the recording, and then I'm going to do a, another recording. It's going to take about five minutes or so to show you how to measure charge.